Hey guys, Kirk Barron here. Thank you so much for joining our podcast. This year we were presented with a challenge that we never expected, which was the pandemic. And we had some of the most amazing people come forward during this time and present some great education. And in this series, we're gonna go back and take a look at the best of the best from the COVID-19 Dental Relief Conference. team for putting on just another incredible week of learning. You know, I'm just so honored to be invited back and to be sharing a little bit more of what we talked about the last time on our ACT and Panky Day with the Clients Therapy, you know, and since I've been on, I've actually become a big raving ACT um, dental fan with all these wonderful presentations. I mean, we're learning everything from the joint and occlusion level to like implants with Scott McLean and to materials and COVID awareness philosophy with Mark Hyman, I mean, airway, I mean, and just the intellectual capital that's coming out of um, these webinars, I just feel like it's such a gift. So, and I love learning, I love dentistry. And I thought that on Friday, Leanne really gave a great, gave a great webinar on core values and it really, um, really hit home for me because service is one of my core values and it brings me so much joy to be able to give back and share the gifts that were um, given to me. You know, and during this time of pause, it's been just awesome to be able to chime in and learn um, with one of these um, presentations and to be able to be a part of that is just, um, to be part of this community has been, has been really awesome. You know, after my last um, webinar, you know, I got a lot of great emails and questions. I felt like I connected with so many different people and they asked me like how I got started in my pinky journey. And just to share that quick story, my dental journey started with me buying a practice. Um, I had a baby and I went down to the pinky essential courses like all in one year. And going down to the Institute during that time, that phase in my life really changed my life. I honestly don't think I'd be the same person or dentist if it wasn't for the learning and the philosophy I learned at the Institute. And I don't think I'd love dentistry as much. I've been able to stand on the shoulders of giants there and, and some have taken me under their wing and just been a great mentor. And um, half the time they'd encourage me to do stuff and to share. And they saw something in me that I didn't even see myself at times. So all of that has been so encouraging and I can't, um, I can't thank the people in my life. I think Jim Otten said that too, you know, about mentorship, but you know, we have a unique ability in our profession to um, receive the mentorship, but once we learn and once we know better, we can actually give that all back and we can actually ourselves be the mentors. So um, just a little bit of that sharing there. Um, I also was asked if I like do a lot of TMD, I have to say I don't specialize in TMD or have a focus in my practice for TMD, but I really love learning about it because I feel like every patient that we see need to be treated with some sort of understanding of the joint health. And if they have healthy joints, wonderful, right? Or if they have damaged joints or we need to address the, the, the joint breakdown, it does help us to treat them better. It does help us to allow us to predictably, restoratively take the patients to form function and aesthetics for longevity, or if we need to be partnering with our interdisciplinary team, right, and um, get them along and be their quarterback, so to speak, or our patient advocate and, and help them along in their, in their path to get better. So appliance therapy has been just an integral part of my everyday dentistry, and I'm just really excited to share a little bit more of that because I felt like we only got to cover like 30% of actually what I really wanted to. So I'm glad I have another opportunity to kind of have that layered learning piece with everyone today. Um, just, I have no financial interest in anything that I share today. I am 
um, um, you know, visiting um, faculty at the Panky Institute, um, and I'm also honored to serve on the board of directors there as well. I also give um, back one day a week. I uh, visit University of Pennsylvania and I teach the restorative microscope dentistry program. So I help teach that course. And from that piece of learning, I actually have a microscope myself, which has been just a fun and an amazing piece of my practice. Um, a little bit of my mission is, and what brings me um, a lot of joy, I guess, is uh, helping each other and building a community so we can bridge the gap between what is learned and what is practiced. Because I feel like half of the learning that I get, I get really excited about it. And then the idea of implementation is sometimes can be challenging and almost daunting. So a lot of the principles or the information that I'm going to share today is going to have um, something that we, we want to do and um, some clinical photos to support how it's done in the practice. Um, this is um, something that I, I love this quote uh, by Pete Dawson, when teeth and muscle war, muscle never loses. Okay, and this is going to be, I believe we're going re to revisit this throughout the presentation, but take a look at this patient here. Um, this is Ruthie. She's only 26 years old and she was referred by her twin sister, which was actually a case I shared um, when I first presented, um, when I showed the veneers that I had started to prep. But this is her twin sister. She was getting headaches, lots of chipping. We can see a lot going on, right? And I'm already thinking like interdisciplinary approach with ortho, getting the bicuspids out, just, you know, her occlusion is colliding rather than connecting evenly. Um, she's got a lot of bone loss. She's got a lot of um, muscle issues and she's got a lot of wear, right? So how do we how do we predictably get these patients, right, and restore them with form and functions and also help partner with our patients for longevity, right? And that's a really important piece with this patient is that we restored her form and function and we, we address uh, some of her occlusal disharmony, but she has a splint to help her protect them. This walks in our door every single day, right? I mean, airway, you know, I'm thinking airway, I'm thinking parafunction, it affects everyone of all ages. And I'm thinking why, like, why is there so much breakdown? There's so much occlusal disease, occlusal disharmony, but these patients are walking in our door, right? They want me to partner with them and help them through the journey of giving them um, a smile again. They want um, stronger teeth. They want to smile again. They know that there's something going on. Before we start, you know, doing um, preparations for patients, right, before we need to understand the etiology of the breakdown before I start doing this kind of dentistry for them, right, if we're going to deliver some aesthetics, form, and functions, I also want this patient to have longevity. Right, and I think this is where the piece of the appliance therapy will be so important because we can use appliance therapy before, during, and after treatment. So let's kind of like, kind of like building blocks here, that piece of layered learning as, um, as I've always sort of um, interpreted it. Why do we, let's go back to the appliances again. Again, my favorite Simon Sinek, right? Let's start with to start with the why idea again and use that as a template for our thought process, right? Let's go over and talk about why, um, why we use some of the appliances. So I talked about the last time my, my two big workhorses, which is the anterior bite planes and the full coverage, but I'd love to kind of revisit those two for those of us that weren't able to be on that webinar, but then also I do want to go into talking about the rest of them. And the big thing is, this is not what we learned in dental school, right? We just learned night guard and that was about it. So one thing, one big take home message I want with appliance therapy is appliance therapy is not the treatment. It's not the finish of treatment. It's actually the start. So that's why even just changing just the verbiage or the semantics of how we think of appliance therapy as therapy really helps build a big picture for the patients. Super critical that a comprehensive exam we need is so needed. And I think Jim, um, Jim McKee and Jim Martin did a beautiful job. And I think it's that part of that layered learning. They did a wonderful job breaking down the joint and the visuals and all of their imaging are, are awesome. But we do need to understand, we need to understand the muscles, the joint, the occlusion, and, and um, 
airway. So just keep that in mind because with that comprehensive exam, from what we learned from that exam, we determine which appliance is best suited for our patients. So I've sort of abridged some of the appliances. So this is with the, with the imaging, with the diagram, with the animation, it's all kind of in one. But let's start with the anterior only appliances. They're called anterior deprogrammers. Some of them are really small. They're panky anterior bite stops, but they're also called Lucia jigs. Most of us know it as the NTI, but it is a wonderful diagnostic tool to have in our dental toolbox, so to speak, uh, because it is wonderful in assessing occlusal muscle disharmony. I mean, just like that. Muscle tension related headaches, it decreases the elevator muscle activity in both clenching and excursions. And this also allows for the seating of the condyle. So it releases the lateral pterygoid muscles. It, there are no posterior teeth that are touching, right? There's, there's no deflecting contacts. The lateral pterygoid muscles are not um, activated. So you get that release of the lateral pterygoid muscle, hence seating the condyle. Wonderful way to deprogram muscles prior to any surgic relation record taking. You have the patients wear this for about two weeks, bring them in, and the biomanual guidance or, or however way you're recording your CR bite records are, are just so much more predictable. There is profoundly so much literature out there about how well these anterior bite stop works. It just decreases the elevator muscle activity, the temporalis and the masseter muscles, and we'll kind of revisit muscles again today too. But um, also this, the, the literature and the evidence made studies about anterior only is because posterior teeth contact, right? No posterior teeth contact. When you have teeth, posterior teeth contact, it increases elevator muscle activity. If you have increased elevator muscle activity, you're going to have increased force going to the temporomandibular joint and the teeth. Like Pete Dawson said, right, the war between muscles and teeth, muscles always win. This is some of the anterior bite planes that, um, that I use in my office. I use, this is a Dr. John Droder um, inspired um, anterior palatal stop. I actually have a protocol. Um, if anybody would like, their, like it, just send me, send me an email and I'll send you how to make it. I like, if the patients are gonna go home with any type of anterior bite planes, anterior bite stops, it's gotta be big enough because we definitely don't want the risk of aspirations when they're too small. So the quick, uh, the quick splints are a really great way. Um, so these are um, uh, nice appliances um, to use. Some of the risks um, to the anterior onlys are, you know, the risk of aspirations. If the, sm the smaller the anterior only appliances are, the higher risk of aspiration, right? So they, like I said, they're wonderful diagnostic tools to release the lateral pterygoid muscle, elevator muscles, and it builds the patient's awareness because it can provide relief right away. And you are then also able to utilize this to, for your centric relation records, but it shouldn't leave your office. So, so just make sure if it's gonna leave your office, um, they, it's, it's a bit bigger. Also, there is a risk for patients that are wearing it for more than eight to 10 hours um, a day. Um, there's a risk of posterior extrusion or anterior teeth intrusion, okay? So, you know, we've all read the stories about how the NTI or some patients have broken off their front teeth with, with the anterior only. These patients fall in the category of the higher risk for clenchers on anterior teeth. I kind of made that up, but you're going to have a smaller percentage of patients that are able to still, even with complete posterior disclusion, they are still going to be able to power down on their anterior teeth. And if you're going to determine whether this patient is going to be a good um, candidate for the anterior only, so just do the clench test. Buy it on the back teeth, have them clench, and see if you've got relief of muscle activity even on their anterior teeth. And I think I saw, uh, it might be yesterday, the days kind of blur, but I think yesterday Dr. Sheesh talked about like the high angle and the low angle um, mandible with the masseter muscles. You definitely want to check that because if a patient can clench on the anterior teeth and they've got that low angle uh, mandible, they're going to power down, you're going to have some teeth breaking. Um, also, the idea of the mandibular repositioning, I'm just going to quickly touch on this, um, but if there is a big MIP and centric occlusion relationship and you put an anterior deprogrammer in and the lateral pterygoid muscle release, 
never happened to me, but it, they say that the lateral pterygoid muscles, the joints seated, the muscles are um, in harmony, doesn't want to go back. This is a risk for patients that have a large discrepancy, like four to five millimeters, or patients that have a lot of malocclusions where they come in and they tell you, like, I don't even know where my bite is. So I almost think, I don't think this is a contraindication, but I actually think this is a good conversation to have because if you have your joint and your muscles aligned, you can have conversations with patients about how to better align your teeth, how to make their teeth fit better. Um, a big contraindication, though, is joint inflammation. If you've got impingement of the retro discal tissue, this seats the condyle, you're going to have pain on um, loading. So if that's the case, any patients whose symptoms get worse, you want to explore your clinical suspicion and you can explore other appliances. Quick review of the temporalis um, or of the muscles. We've got the temporalis muscle, it elevates, retracts, and a real important sort of secondary function is that the anterior fibers of the temporalis, it goes down behind the eye and attaches into the, into the coronoid process. So it helps to elevate the condyle into the fossa. What patients will come in and tell you, and they're gonna, they're gonna tell you that they've got the upper eye, sensitivity around the upper eye or headaches, um, their teeth are sensitive, or they're going to get the headaches. This is taken from Janet Travell's Trigger Point Manual, and this has been one of the key things that I use for my patients in doing that um, new patient exam, where patients come in and they tell you they're, they're getting these headaches. You can identify from what they're telling you from these Trigger Point Manuals from the pain referral patterns to the muscles that are involved. So let's go on to the masseter. Again, it's an elevator muscle, right? We see those patients with their really large masseter muscles, and you know, it's a muscle. Just like if we're building a bicep, right? And we do a lot of bicep curls, it tears a muscle and the muscle gets bigger. Same thing, we can sometimes even see in patients, we've got asymmetry in their faces, and I'll see like a really large asymmetrical masseter muscle on the right side. Well, intraorally, I'm thinking, right, the war between muscles and teeth, right? Muscles always win. So I'm also even going to look for that occlusal connection of maybe seeing more wear, right? Or I'm going to hear of a history of some broken teeth. But what patients will also tell you is from the trigger point is they're going to feel like they've got the above the eyebrow headaches, their ear, they'll get an earache, or they'll say they went to the ENT and there's nothing wrong with their ear, they don't know what's going on, or their posterior teeth or their teeth in general will be really sensitive. We've got the digastric muscle, a really important muscle because this um, has a strong occlusal connection, right? So we're going to have patients where we see their anterior um, crowns, right, really worn in. Um, they're going to have these distalizing contacts. This is the envelope of function violation. So when we see envelope of function violations in dentistry, right, where, where this patient's going to come in and say, I want, I think I want all new crowns. And this is actually my, my patient, and we did actually do all new crowns. But, um, I, you know, first things first is I saw all this wear right, on the linguals of her crowns, and even the previous dentist put all this metal in there. Um, I'm thinking envelope of function, bite constriction violation. So I want to make sure that the patient's more comfortable because she wasn't. She was getting angle of the mandible tenderness, like this trigger point here says. She was getting some neck pain, and she felt like her front teeth were really sore. So you know, we, we go through these things and we make the connections between the muscles and the appliance therapy because ultimately these patients um, want dentistry and they want to feel better. The medial pterygoid muscle elevates them, um, the muscle um, of the mandible. It's a, it's a closing muscle again. And you're going to get ear stuffiness with this, um, with this um, muscle that's hyperactive. And we've got the lateral pterygoid muscle, we've got the upper head and the lower head, and we know that the insertion is what's really fascinating because it inserts into the disc, the capsule, and the, and the, and the condyle. So it's a supporting muscle to the condyle against the eminence during closure. It's in protrusive and lateral excursive movements. And so, and this is the muscle that we work so hard to control and to have um, released and have a seated condylar position in centric relation. 
And the reason for that is that I thought, you know, again, I'm going to put Jim McKee and Jim Mountain out there, but they did a really nice job in terms of disc sounds and disc positions. And so I really don't need to go into that, um, um, nor do I, I think I know enough to be able to kind of go through all that. But just, just sort of from, from my understanding, the disc is sort of designed to rotate along the condyle kind of like a bucket handle, right? So it attaches to the medial and the lateral pole of the condyle. And this is so that the disc can stay aligned with the condyle and go along for the ride, so to speak, with the condyle while it rotates and translates. Rotation along the medial pole for the first 25 millimeters, and then it translates moving to the lateral. So that's why Jim Otten was saying how the, the timing of the sound of the clicks and when it clicks and if there's all that stuff, we can start to extrapolate really what's going on um, in the disc. In addition to the fact that if you have a CBCT and a, a, the capability of taking a, MRIs, it just gives us more information. So then we have the posterior ligament, right? It's tethered to the back of the condyle in that middle picture by collagen fiber. So this prevents the disc from rotating too far forward and prevents the disc from being displaced. So if all the connective tissue there, attachments to the disc are designed to prevent the disc from anterior displacement, how does the disc become anteriorly displaced? You know, so that pulling action, right, of the disc coming forward, um, it can come, it can happen for many reasons, obviously, but a, a pull action is from that lateral pterygoid muscle and the elastic fibers coming from in front of the disc. I mean, you can actually, there, you can have an inflammatory process. It can be developmental. You know, um, you know Drew's gonna talk about, you know, the um, trauma in children and early and how they're developmentally sort of um, not growing, but it's that lateral pterygoid muscle that actually pulls the disc forward. So if we can have a nice seated condylar position, which is why the thought of so many people, um, why that camp of centric relation is so important because it's absolutely a re repeatable position, right? We can stabilize the joint. We're releasing that lateral pterygoid muscle, and it does help um, with doing some restorative dentistry in that repeatable position. So I also want to just kind of give credit to sort of the postural experts and physical therapy because we have patients like this come in our door all the time, right? We've got that appreciation for the cranial, mandibular, cervical muscles, right? And how these head forward posture patients were like looking at airway, right? And their head hits forward. They have a ton of neck pain, right? And, um, and they don't feel well. So I talked about that digastric muscle. This is like one of my favorite you know, slides because it's just an appreciation for how so much is going on in our neck. But that hyoid bone, right? There's about like 10 um, hyoid uh, muscles that are attached to the hyoid bone. And that's why there's so much talk about this bone. I've heard in like three other sort of webinars about um, people talking about the hyoid bone. Well, we've got the genial hyoid muscle working with the genioglossus muscle, which are airway dilators. And so in some of these um, obstructive sleep apnea cases, we've got, there. that's why they're talking about how there's a more of a caudal, a more of a posterior position of the hyoid and it's further down. Okay, so um, moving on to the next one really quick, because I touched on this the last time, but this is just about the safest appliance to make. It works for most joint conditions, any muscle conditions. Um, it, it's a really straightforward appliance to make if you just understand a couple principles here. It can create a physiologic occlusion. You get a stable occlusal preview. So you get occlusal stability that your natural teeth wasn't providing. It's removable, alterable, and reversible. So whether we're starting in with a little bit of us with an anterior guidance, right, and a little CR with the CR ramp here, or if it's gonna have completely flat or no guidance at all, these are really great appliance to me given circumstances of what you wanna achieve. This does release the lateral pterygoid muscles and that's why adjustments are done over, over time. So this is just, just to kind of illustrate, you know, we've got 
the, this is a lower splint. It's going to go over the lower teeth. And you can imagine the teeth, right? So the splint is creating the occlusal stability for you and allowing you to achieve a nice occlusal harmony that the natural teeth are giving you. So if you were to go back whenever that is, and I hope that's soon, but when you go back to your practice, if you're making bite splints, there's just a couple key things that you can do right away to make your splints just 100% better. So after you deliver it, make sure you adjust it, right? Make sure it's really comfortable for the patient. And one, a key place to adjust it is, is on the linguals. If patients complain of any bite splint that's too bulky, they're always gonna tell you it's on the lingual. So make sure that's really nice and smooth. And there actually should be zero mobility. When you lift the bite splint up and down, the bite splint shouldn't be moving. It should be really stable because anything like squishy, patients will tend to play with it. And there's a lot of talk about how the stability of the pines can really make the patients get better. So an ill-fitting splint can have just the opposite effects. And we really need to make sure that we're, they're really well adjusted and they fit comfortably. Adjustments are done over time because we are uh, releasing the lateral pterygoid muscle and we're seeding the condyles. So make sure that you've got some occlusal contacts, you're adjusting them over time, and you want immediate posterior disclusion because we have decreased elevator muscles in excursion. And we know that the war between muscles and teeth, muscles always win. So we definitely want to sh make sure we've got um, canine guidance. We want shallow anterior disclusion, and we want to um, monitor the, the, the dots and stripes over time. So if the patient is having increased pain um, with these bite splints, I would just revisit your clinical suspicion, right? We have to revisit your hypothesis, right? And that's why I always start with a little bit of a ramp. And over time, if I need to make adjustments on it, and I understand, and I try to listen to what the patients are telling you. So if they've got persistent joint pain on ladder excursives, and Jim talked about this also, um, that's telling us right, that there's more of a joint involvement and they might need to be uh, better off having a more of a joint supported um, bite position rather than than being a more joint support. Just all just information about how we can revisit our clinical suspicion. So here's a patient that, um, that came to me and she experiencing jaw pain, sensitive teeth and chipping, right? So we go through our um, comprehensive exam, right? I do a dental exam, a joint exam. There's a simple airway um, uh, sleeping, um, F4 sleepiness scale in there. Um, I talk to patients about nasal breathing, how important that is, but all that is there. And then I also go over the functional occlusal exam. And what, we're, and what I found was she had pretty much inadequate protrusive guidance, working and non-working interferences, definitely not getting occlusal harmony um, from her natural dentition. And her elevator muscles are always active and she's able to power down. She doesn't have any relief from anterior guidance. So these are her pictures here. And um, so problem list, occlusal muscle, she's having some myofascial pain, obviously um, upper lower wear, parafunction, loss of anterior guidance and uh, working and non-working interferences. Um, I wanna share with you um, LD's Panky's Three Rules of Occlusion. And this is sort of, I think about this all the time. Every, if it's one tooth or a full mouth rehab, you know, these are some really key pearls that we, you need to know in terms of occlusion. With the condyle seated in the fossa, posterior teeth should touch simultaneously and evenly, and anterior teeth should touch lightly. When you squeeze, either a tooth nor the mandible should move. When you move the mandible and any excursions, no back tooth hits before a harder um, or after a front tooth. Should have anterior guidance with canine guidance and smooth crossover to anterior teeth and, protrus and protrusion um, context should be even on both um, incisors and got to pay attention to curve of ski and curve of Wilson. Well, we pay attention so much to occlusion because it does mitigate muscle activity. We want to minimize force, distribute the force, minimize tooth load and joint load, 
and minimize muscle contraction because whatever we're going to do for this patient here, I want to make sure that I'm going to create some type of occlusal harmony so that there's predictability. So, you know, I'm trying my best not to be that dentist again that's going to have to put little um, anterior, anterior um, restorations and have them chip again, right? So predictably with understanding occlusion, we can actually um, promote more stability. So what do we do for this patient? Well, we decided I, my favorite appliance to make, my go-to is the flat plane um, whole coverage appliances. So we discussed doing um, Beitzman therapy and, um, and this is, can be another topic, but you know, what do you do after Beitzman therapy, right? Well, you've got some choices. We either, um, you know, we reshape, we restore, we can talk about orthodontics. We wanna basically, once you've created a stable joint position, and you can give them the occlusion that you've created on your bite spline onto their natural teeth. And that's a conversation we need to have with our patients as to like, how are we gonna get those things aligned again for you? So we decided to do um, a um, simple equilibration and uh, with the restorative workup, we discussed just doing composite. So here's a case where I did um, a bite spline for her. Disclusion, canine guidance, this one had a ramp. And I got a seated condylar position. I identified where the first point of contact was. And we discussed this the last time, how records are so important because we can really mimic the arc of closure, right? So um, taking a proper um, occluder records and face bow is critical. I decided to put some wax. I did a trial equilibration here on the model, which is see the yellow and the green going on. But I also decided to put a little wax on the teeth to make sure I got the anterior guidance correct because she was obviously really deficient in the anterior guidance. So what I did in this case was I actually did a Siltec um, putty, right? So I duplicated the model from the wax up and I created a Siltec putty and I actually um, built her um, inside her anterior teeth in that way. So that's just um, her after pictures and the bite splint. She, she wore her bite splint um, right after and it fit well. And we were able to improve just with composite restorations and just um, and a little bit of reshaping and through the equilibration, we were able to give her the anterior guidance that she didn't have. She actually felt an immediate um, difference. So there's your before and afters and simple composite restorations, reshaping, just applying the principles, applying therapy and occlusion, knowing um, um, and applying that. And just a really common study, but this is really important, I think, for, for us doing a lot of um, general dentistry is for every 10 degree change in the angle of exclusion, 30% change in the force applied. So take home message, make your cuspid rise, your guidance is as shallow as we can because, and as smooth as possible because we want less force going to the system. So we've got, we've got um, why the appliance? So many reasons here, you know, protects the teeth, relief of symptoms, therapeutic, diagnostic, um, verifies the centric relation. And I think just more importantly, there's a tremendous amount of co-discovery. I love that word because it allows trust and ownership coming from the patients um, as well as, um, uh, you know, I'm fully invested in the patients also, but there's just so much to learn from these appliances. So let's move on with the posterior only. This complete opposite to the posterior pivot appliances, which is, um, or to the anterior appliance, these are the Gelb appliances or the Aqualizer. I would recommend having a few aqualizers sort of in your dental toolbox there because um, you know some of the indications for, for an aqualizer, is, let's say you have a traumatic accident, you have a patient with a traumatic accident to the chin, driving the condyles back into the retro discal tissue and, um, and the patient can't bite on their back teeth and you, the patients can't open, so you can't take any records and you use, let's say, an anterior deprogrammer, right? Because you think that'll work and it actually makes them feel worse. So when you use an anterior deprogrammer and that make they feel worse, you know that there's more involved than just the muscle. So anterior deprogrammers, muscle only. So you can pop the posterior pivot in, have them wear that, 
for um, a couple of weeks and then have them come back and revisit what's going on. Not a recommended appliance for long term at all because same thing with um, anterior ulnars, you can get tooth intrusion and you can have eruption from excessive use. And this is a biggie because patients feel better with the posterior pivots that have a lot of internally deranged joints and they want to keep it in all the time. Soft appliances, the only way that I use soft appliances is I'll get that three millimeter soft guard material and I'll use it to protect provisionals. The concept though, is that it's good for bad joints when they need support in the balancing and the non-balancing excursives. So what you need to do though, is we're gonna use this as a joint supported appliance. You need, to, um, you need to warm the posteriors and actually um, equilibrate the soft guard with like a little, hand, like with something. Um, so that's something that you can do. I don't do it, but like I said, in theory, um, it's, it's done. I'm just checking my time. Um, okay, so we've got the anterior positioning, and I think Drew's going to talk about this today because this, the anterior only clients, and this is courtesy, I had to ask um, um, some faculty for um, a photo of the anterior onlys because I don't make this often, and I didn't have a picture of it, and I wanted to show it, but this is taking the condyles down and out of the fossa and allowing, if you have inflammation in the joint space, by removing the condyles down and forward, you're actually relieving that. So this is, again, uh, ball's got to go back in the hole so e eventually. So it's used for different clinical um, um, applications. The other one that I want to show you is the mandibular advancement device. This, um, um, I do make these in my office too. So this is obviously a CPAP is the gold, um, the gold standard. But if you have a patient that's um, CPAP intolerant, um, and um, this is a good treatment option. So that's one in my practice that I make. This is a somnomed. So here is a example of where I use one of these appliances. This is John, and after the comprehensive exam, we learned that he has sleep apnea, and he's CPAP intolerant, never actually just went back to the doctor and can't, couldn't wear his CPAP. Also came to me and said, I keep breaking my teeth. Um, I'm chipping them. And so um, after the comprehensive exam, um, we decided to do some dentistry. So we did some, um, this is uh, Lee Colt milled these lithium desilicates for me. So we did some lithium desilicate veneers. Um, and then afterwards, we delivered a mandibular advancement device for him. So again, it's just, you know, what we want to do is, you know, we want to partner with our patients to do, you know, these really predictable dentistry, but also we want to identify why. And, and I was just even happier that we were able to make something for him that was going to protect his dentistry and make him feel better. Hey, Michelle, a uh, question for you. Can you describe what the um, great presentation, before you leave the slide, can you describe the pulse oximeter data that you collected there, how you did that, and what you're using that for? Yeah, yeah, so I'm kind of a newbie to this, but, um, but um, a couple of years ago, um, I, this is a Minolta um, high-resolution pulse oximeter, and I use it as a diagnostic tool, right, because for us, at least in the state of Pennsylvania, you know, the diagnosis of um, sleep apnea, and, and I would not want to be the one diagnosing it either, but um, it has to be done by a sleep physician, but it really does open up a wonderful conversation with patients about identifying, and he, this patient knew that he had sleep apnea, but we have a lot of patients, we're on the front line where, you know, half the patients um, we're seeing, um, you know, know that they have some sort of sleep disturbed um, sleeping issues that haven't been screened. So I use this as sort of a diagnostic screening tool, and also after having the conversation with their sleep physician, so I wrote a letter and I called the fleet sleep physician and said, you know, I don't know if you know, re remember your patient, but you know, John um, is CPAP intolerant and uh, you know, they signed a CPAP affidavit stating that he was not going to wear the CPAP and that a mandibular advancement device was a good treatment option for him. And so, but I had him wear the sleep appliance with um, the, with the pulse socks, you know, and just for just 
practice building and just to just so I I know what's going on also to see if this mandibular advancement device was working um, was working well for him and that it didn't need to be titrated I actually had him wear this and we've got patient information they're going to tell us that they sleep better whether we need to keep keep advancing it because in my mind you know we work so hard <laughs> to get everything in a really good occlusal space and then we work then to take it out, right? To take the ball out of the socket and move it forward. And so my learning and my mindset is like, well, let's just how far forward, what's the least amount of forward, uh, forward movement can we take the patient, right? Without doing too much. And so, so I kind of walk the patient forward and you can use this high resolution pulse oximeter to do that. I think Steve Carsonson had a really great webinar um, which I participated in. Um, and we also actually have a Panky um, uh, webinar on Thursday. He's going to be talking more about um, airway. But that's just some of the things I think from like a mini general dental perspective that we can apply. Hope I answered that. <laughs> yeah, that was great. I just wanted more, more like if I look at that, that uh, graph, and it shows the green line. What's that showing me that it's below 90% saturation? Is that kind of uh, yeah, so, what I'm so, seeing? Right. Yep, yep. So he's got like, um, so right up here, he's got some, he's got really low RDIs. And then up here, um, he's got, I can't see this well, but yeah, he's got, you know, we're, we're, we're well above um, the 90. I mean, we're at, so he's really, really doing well. Uh, if you were to see his other um, ones, he had a lot more um, respiratory disturbance index was a lot higher. So, I mean, the greens and the, the greens and the red are just really good indicators, but definitely he's airing in, you know, and he's reporting that he's doing um, a lot better. I mean, he was airing more in this area also. And I, and I, and he had another sleep study done, obviously, to, to support this. Yeah. One last question. Why don't you go from splint therapy to the mandibular repositioning do you see any kind of problems like in this kind of restricted position for these patients or what are your kind of thoughts of like what happens when you kind of control that position since you're in cr it's much better is that kind of what happens um, I kind of missed the, the, the connections really um, not so good but what I heard was um, CR versus the mandibular advancement device um, in this patient, I actually did not start with a um, CR, a centric relation um, bite record um, or a CR appliance. I actually used a anterior deprogrammer and I actually um, um, were able to get a reproducible CR position with an anterior deprogrammer. We did the dentistry. He was provisionalized for many months just so I understood sort of the, the position and make sure that we were in a seated condylar position. And we know that because the, uh, the contacts on the provisionals, um, they don't change, just like we would on, an, on a, a full plane, full flat plane appliance. And then we finished with the mandibular advancement device after the dentistry. And then I also, and then, and I also make AM aligners, right? So in the morning, so he can get back onto his um, back teeth. Okay, perfect, thanks. All right, so this is just a, um, a little dental humor. <laughs> this is such a disturbingly funny movie. But uh, yeah, and this is basically saying don't get fancy. So here we go. Hope it plays. Yeah, we're not getting the sound here. Oh, okay. I'm just. Uh, Yeah, but who doesn't like to look at Bradley Cooper, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, anyway, so it's, true. it's just a funny clip saying, you know, he's just a dentist and they'll get fancy. And so um, uh, it's, it's a shame you didn't get to see it. But um, it's just a little humor. But, you know, we're in such a great position in our, in our profession to help our patients in health and wellness. And the knowledge that we're getting from all of this learning, 
um, you know, and in these webinars, um, but just a simple screening with sleep screening and the stop bangs and the F4C fitness scales and the TMJ exams and how we bring forth our best self in the dental practice with these comprehensive exams just really change lives. And, you know, we can be the change we see in the world. So, um, you know, I, I, I love the learning. Okay, so obviously, just to revisit, so therapeutic, we got that, diagnostic, we got that, um, and here's a case here um, where, you know, when we talked about patients are going to get better, they're going to, um, they're going to stay the same, or they're going to get worse, so here's Emmy, she is, um, headaches, neck pain, jaw pain, sleeping issues, there is um, zero days in a month she's pain-free, that's significant. Um, she's getting, she's just hurting all the time. So took a really good history, right side clicking started, and then it started locking, left side clicking. Um, she, we did the muscle exam, right? So it kind of go through a lot of the muscles. And I asked her, I said, Emmy, color in, in this, in this diagram where, where you're hurting. I mean, she colored in her entire back, right? And her neck. I mean, the whole thing, pretty significant. And she said, you know, I have a high threshold for pain as well. So if you look at this, this is the same slide, um, but she's got that head forward posture which makes sense, which is why she's having so much pain. And our PTs and our posture expert, experts out there will notice that her body is, her shoulders are uneven. She's kind of holding herself to kind of keep herself steady and her body's completely flipped, you know? So definitely some postural issues. Dentally, we're seeing this, well, she's deficient, right? In narrow maxilla, she's got deficiency in the maxilla and in the mandible. She's got the really dry lips. Um, she's mouth breathing. I mean, there's, there's a lot going on here. Her comfortable opening is only at 25. So we know that she's only in the rotational right now and her left and left, left and right lateral, she's, very minimal. She can only go four millimeters, which is which is gives us an idea of the impingement, right? Which is give us an idea of the location of, of the disc. And you know, we know a lot now about the effects of mouth breathing. You know, we're learning the adverse effect of mouth breathing and facial growth, right? And so in this picture, in this article, the girl in the left. Same, same two girls here, six years old on the left, a severe mouth breather, and then at age nine with that normal face growth. I mean, we've got dental malocclusion. She's got that really long doliocephalic face with the malocclusion. Facial growth, tongue position, mouth breathing, so incredibly important. And we've seen this study about the rhesus monkeys, but, but poor monkeys, but they plugged their noses and they, and they saw them develop and the ones that were mouth breathers, these monkeys developed into um, having nasal obstruction, I mean, uh, low tongue uh, position and malocclusion. So developmentally, we can appreciate and we're learning more and more how that tongue position is so important. Gimino stuff is just amazing. I mean, I love all of the literature out there and Gimino stuff is by far just, he's like the sleep god. Um, but the mouth breathing and the extended head posture, the lower mandibular posture, the constricted maxillary arch development, it kind of all cycles, cycles around the fact that, you know, it's developmentally, mouth breathing is, is, um, is not good. So going back to Emmy here. So, um, you know, she was on um, anti-inflammatory, she was on magnesium and, and cyclobenzaprine, and they wanted to explore the option of making a bite stent. And I'll go into that um, and what I learned. But we also had a CBCT. She had no posterior disc space that we, um, we were all talking about. She had left sinus surgery, deviated septum. I mean, just, just posturally, you can tell that she might be struggling in terms of her airway. Um, distalized condyles. So I had the report done. Condyle head is small in relationship to the overall. She also had a sleep study. It actually came back um, not as quote unquote bad as they thought it was going to be. She had mild, um, uh, mild sleep apnea. 
she also had an MRI. So this patient, I actually partnered with her. They really didn't have any information about what was, they didn't really have the knowledge on, on what to do. And I think if I approached the patient and said, you know, I think I need you to, you know, get a CBCT, get an MRI, you might need surgery, all this stuff. Um, I don't know that they'd be as willing, but it was the beauty of doing this appliance therapy. She got some relief from the appliance therapy, but what happened was I got to know this patient and this patient got to know me. And as she was getting some relief, they were starting to make the overall connection about her sleeping issues, um, why her jaw was hurting so bad and why the jaw developmentally, she's really restricted. That was adding to everything else that was going on. So one thing came after another, but slowly they became more confident and they, and they partnered with me and saying, okay, well, what do we need to do? So obviously this was an interdisciplinary approach here, right? Because with this bike splint, she got a little better but you know, but that's not good enough for patients. We want them to get better. And what was stemming was a lot more going on. So the conversation that I had um, with, um, with the oral surgeon and with the orthodontist was, listen, there's multifactorial conditions going on. She's, has, this has created a maladaptation of ME system stemming from craniofacial development deficiency of the maxilla and the mandible. I believe that there's mouth breathing, tongue restriction, airway, TMD, muscle splinting, posture, and upper airway resistance syndrome, and cortisol attack. So, you know, and basically, Emmy was not adapting favorably. So the treatment was, and, you know, she had some family history of just, just with insurance and whatnot. I actually wanted her to go to Dr. Ed Zubovitz in Bowie, Maryland, um, but she ended up having to kind of go through a different um, system. But nonetheless, she had um, ortho and um, orthognathic surgery. So she had a mandibular advancement and she had orthognathic surgery. And that was her coming to me um, about a year, year and a half, almost, I mean, this journey um, took quite a bit, but um, she looked just so much better. She was sleeping better. And you can see in her posture even, right? I mean, completely changed. Patients with a head forward posture, they just want to breathe. So we took a fun photo together like this and um, just a really great way to make a difference and um, just super happy that she uh, basically has um, her life back and um, she's a happy um, 14, well now 15 year old. So um, in the last couple of minutes, I thought maybe I'm going to condense this, but I wanted to share sort of a personal journey with you as I close the presentation. And, you know, the learning and the growth and the plateau after plateau that, that we go through in our journey has led me to actually kind of get a little bit more insight and be able to help my son. So when we, this journey was when he was six years old, you know, I identified the fact that he was not developing well. He had a really narrow maxilla. He had a tongue tie. We've had two sleep studies. He had a really deep bite. I mean, this picture, as you see, I mean, this picture was taking like around noon time, you know, and Nathan, my son, Nathan, he looks tired, you know? You know, children that age should be sleeping 10 to 11 hours a day, and Nathan would come to me in the middle of the night and not want to even go to sleep because I don't think he actually slept well. He'd always come to me at 4 o'clock in the morning, and um, these are the things I was starting to pick up for him. Well, as sleep is really important for adults, it is even more important for children as the sleep cycle increasing from infancy um, through REM, well, you know, they need to get through the deep stages of sleep because growth hormone is released in N3. So we need, the kids need delta sleep, the deep sleep so that they get their growth hormone. And so these are really important for us to even identify some of these issues with children. So um, I, I mentioned UARS, and this is obviously not the space to be talking about this, but what I learned from my son is that you know, um, UARS is a subtle form of sleep disordered breathing that leads to significant clinical symptoms, um, day and nighttime disturbances, right? And they can suggest abnormal breathing during sleep, but no obstruction is found. And physicians may mistakenly assume an absence of sleep related um, issues. So this UARS, it's actually really common through in, in pediatrics. So it affects the small, the children and our young females. 
but this is what my son had and he had a sleep study and he didn't really have any ethnic events but this is this is what um, he looked like and he was not um, breathing or sleeping well and this is just just more on um, nasal breathing and you know there's a lot and i think there's going to be other learning around this but just with TMD and upper airway resistance syndrome is sleep and airway, all that TMD isn't related. One interesting thing with my son was he actually failed his hearing exam at school. So he had to get uh, a, 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 sleep, a hearing test. And one thing that I learned was that with rapid maxillary expansion and conductive hearing loss. So um, when we have the narrow maxillas, um, it does affect um, the eustachian tubes. So there, so there was a study on rapid um, maxillary expansion can have a positive effect on both the improvement in hearing and normal function of the eustachian tubes. So, so he was going through ortho. We were, you know, expanding his maxilla, and um, and he actually, and I never really could make the connection, but he was always, you know. Um, getting, you know, ear infections, and there's always, like, he had always ear stuff, and, you know, the, there's a relationship with transverse high palatal arches and conductive hearing loss, and this was an article, this was um, a study that I read, but it's really important, so that got me kind of spiraled out and geeking out on the learning a little bit more because of my son, and I learned that there's some, there's, there's a connection to ear stuffiness with the palate, here. So if you see the little muscles coming back, we've got the tensor valley palatini. We've got the all these um, levator palatini muscles that are strapping along the, the palate and it goes up and attaches to the eustachian tube. So not only do these rapid palatal expansions have just a, an incredible effect of, you know, expanding the maxilla or the floor of the nose, but also it actually is connected to some ear stuffiness. There's some cool stuff. So I'm um, I think I'm running out of time, but I want to show you, I actually documented, um, um, and my poor son, really, because he's like, Mom, do you have to take another picture of my tongue? Because we're doing it. But anyway, so wow. he had a tongue tie release. Um, he was maximal whooping 40, and to the spot, um, right behind the two centrals, it's called the spot. So you measure, and there's ways to measure that, um, but he had, um, he could not open, and he had his tongue tie release here. So the day of the procedure, um, I had a pediatric dentist I partnered with, um, he did that, he had a light scalpel, and that's immediately after the surgery, and I have actually documentation of all of the healing process. So that's day one, and that white look is actually normal. So we're going through the post-op healing here and how that looks, and basically at three months, look at how well he's opening, right? Obviously, we had mild functional therapy. And the thing is, is I want that tongue, right, engaged on that roof of the mouth, right, forming the palate and creating a tongue space for him. And he just couldn't do it. So mild functional therapy, again, another, you know, conversation for another day, but this has been really important for him with nasal breathing. And so I do X clear strips or X clear uh, nasal sprays. We use breathe right strips and it kind of got me really excited about this nasal breathing here. So I actually recommend this type of face taping for all my patients. Just kidding. But I sent my team um, to um, some courses about the importance of nasal breathing and just a little shout out to my team. Um, but yeah, they're, um, we're all learning together. So um, just, just in summary, you know, he had, he had an expansion, he's got an expander, he had tongue tie revision, he had mild functional therapy, um, trying to get this boy to, sl um, to sleep more, we've got nasal breathing, and I know there's some pediatric stuff going on, but this is some of the great stuff that um, is going out there, is not only can we help patients, but I circled around and was able to identify something um, even in my own um, family. So in closing, I want to share with you something that I learned. Um, this is LD Pankey's Cross of Dentistry. So when I went down to the Pankey Institute, I saw this construct and I was like, and my face lit up. I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, this is it, you know? And what we want to take home would, would be, you know, we have to know our patient, 
right? We have to know your work, you have to apply your knowledge, and you have to know yourself, right? And we're in a space right now um, to do all those things, and knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. And that's, you know, um, been the hardest for me. We think about questions like, who am I, and what do I want to be when I grow up? But, you know, and what kind of dentist do I want to be, right? It made me really see um, a lot of things about how we want to be within ourselves and how we bring our, how we want to bring our patients along, how we want to bring our team along. So um, right now, I know there's a big pause in our lives right now, but we can sort of sharpen our skills and our solves and kind of revisit things. So when we go back, um, we are better versions of ourselves. So um, thank you so much um, for having me again. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was awesome. I so appreciate it. Um, there are a number of questions. Um, I'm just going to cover a few of them real quick because we're running run short on time. But um, uh, one thing kept coming up um, was uh, when do you use a ramp on an appliance and when do you not? If you can just kind of address that briefly. Yeah, I actually, you know, the company's exam is um, really important. But if I'm um, suspicious of more of a, a muscle related issue, I will always start with a little ramp. Right. And then I partner with the patients to tell me whether they feel comfortable with that ramp. And I shallow that out as much as possible. Right. And if there's pain on joint loading, I get a little sus suspicious because I want more of a flat plane then. And so I'll start shallowing it out. It's so much harder to add to the appliance to get posterior disclusion than to take away. So I normally start with a little ramp and depending on um, um, the, the joint health, I will start to take that down. So when you start taking it down and you don't have any anterior guidance and all teeth touch, it becomes a more of a joint supporting appliance. And I don't know if you can add to that, Jim, too, because you get such a great talk, but that's sort of my mindset. Start with a little bit of ramp and start working your way. That's why it's called therapy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, there's no one specific way to go about doing it. It depends a lot on translatory pain and the functions of the joint and what's happening at that level as well. But uh, thank you. I, I wish we had more time. Anybody has other questions, post them in the, on the uh, Facebook page and we can uh, go back and, and try to answer them there. And there's Michelle's contact information and she'll accept as many as a thousand emails today. If you want to go ahead and send them. <laughs> no, wonderful presentation, Michelle. Thank you so much. So many nice comments about you and your style is so incredible. So thanks for your presentation. Hey, if you enjoyed this week's episode of the Best Practice Show podcast, we invite you to check out actdentalu.com. ActDentalU is the essential resource for anyone at any stage of starting, growing, or running a great dental practice. Whether you're just getting started or whether you're a well-established dental practice, ActDentalU can help you and your team get to the next level. With our extensive course library and all the current best practices in dentistry and our Friday master classes and workshops for you and your team and a supportive, active community to help you along the way with encouragement and feedback Act Dental U is the perfect place for any dentist to create a better dental practice so that you can have the freedom to enjoy a better life. So check it out at actdentalu.com.